Greetings, cultivators from around the world. Jordan River here, back with more Growcast. And I'm whatever ploy do you want me to be. Today, we have Dr. Coco on the line. This is a very good episode. I really can't put it any other way. I think you're going to absolutely love what Coco brings to the table as he talks about traditional ag breeding versus what we're doing. Also, he goes deep into lights. I know you guys love that. There's so much more. Enjoy, everybody. Before we get into it with Coco, though, going to give some love to Rimrock Analytical. Stop wasting time sex testing, everyone. RimrockAnalytical.com. Code GROWCAST for free shipping on your tests. It is worth every penny. If you get more than 10 as well, you should write customer support. Right, Taylor? Tell him to uh, hook you up with the bulk pricing. If you get 100 of those tests, he'll give you a better price. Um, or if you just need five for your home grow, it is such a waste to have to sex your regular genetics, grow out those males, waste all that nutrient and space and soil, just sex test them as a seedling and call the males. Use rimrockanalytical.com, use code GROWCAST. And anytime you use our codes, send a snapshot to us. Get it to us, folks, any way you can. Email, IG, Discord, and you're entered to win free seeds every month. So go and get it, everybody. Rimrockanalytical.com, code GROWCAST. Stay tuned for more deals coming from Rimrock. Seed Co. teaming up with Rimrock. All sorts of exciting stuff there. Also, at the end of this week, I am in Southern California, everyone. Friday the 18th. If you're in LA, if you're in San Diego, come on down. We're at the Meta Sun Shop, 420 to 620. That's 420 to 620, everybody. At the Meta Sun Shop, Oceanside, California. And uh, we'll see you there. Seed Swap. Very special guest. Uh, Pizza. I'll see you there, everybody. Free to attend. Listeners, members, everybody. This Friday, the 18th. SoCal. All right. Let's get into it with Dr. Coco. Thank you for listening and enjoy the show. Hello, podcast listeners. You are now listening to Growcast. I'm your host, Jordan River, and I want to thank you for tuning in today. Ooh, excuse me. Before we get started, I urge you, as always, to share the show. Spread Growcast. Tell a grower. Get someone new growing. That is the ultimate goal here at Growcast and the Order of Cultivation, our membership program. If you haven't checked it out, go check it out. Growcastpodcast.com slash membership. Hundreds of hours of bonus content, personal garden support, and most of all, community like you wouldn't believe. Today, 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 we have, oh, we're in the middle of breeder feature February. While this isn't necessarily a breeder feature, we're going to go deep into testing and genetics from a very interesting perspective. You know him, you love him. Dr. Coco is back. What's up, Dr. Coco? Hey, Jordan. Happy to be back. It's been a, a minute since I've been on the show. I'm happy to reacquainted with the, the wonderful Growcast audience out there. It has. I am Dr. MJ Coco from CocoForCannabis.com. <laughs> well, it hasn't been that long. Calm down, Coco. And for the me- <laughs> and, and for the members, you've seen them on Growcast TV. Love those Q&As live. Those are fucking killer. Oh, yeah. We should do another one of those. Yeah. So so it has been a minute for just the pod, the average podcast listener, though. So um, welcome back. What have you been up to, man? I know you've been hard at work with the website, with uh, testing lights. What have you been doing? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I've been testing some interesting lights, been, you know, setting up my own grow again. I'm growing with the the New Year's Grow Challenge we got going on at Cocoa for Cannabis. Put together my four by four tent again. So I'm, I'm sort of staging back up to to run that four by four grow for this NYGC, which I should have already done at this point, to be honest with you, since it started on New Year's and it's already February now. But you know how plants grow. I'm sort of <laughs> going with them. Um, I've been busy testing lights. I'm producing videos. I did a, a cool video at the beginning of the year um, reviewing the, the nine five by five fixtures that I had tested in the past year. And it was interesting. I, it's sort of the first time I did a, a comparison video like that. It seemed to go over well. And this helped me kind of think about how to refine some of the ways that I approach my my reviews and analyses just tested a couple more five by five fixtures. Actually, I just tested yesterday the Metacro Smart Eight, which is uh, oh, hell the yeah. light you guys are running for your seeds. That's absolutely. I was just going to say Rizo Rich Seed Co. powered by those Metacros. We like the Metacros, the folds because of their cheaper price, but these Smarts look pretty cool. We won't spend too much time on it, man. We were actually riffing on them last episode. I think this is the future with the onboard displays yeah. and the onboard dimmer. I mean, like, 
things are going to get more and more intuitive. There's going to be more like guided user interfaces, less just like tactile shit. You know what I mean? Yep. It's a really good fixture. Yeah, no, I like the onboard displays. I like some of the adjustabilities. And those are the kinds of features that, that yeah, home growers, you know, smaller scale growers could really use. And some of the companies that are primarily thinking of their audience as, you know, large commercial facilities that are going to be running a thousand of these or whatever, they, they have a, you know, a, a different set of needs. They're going to be running them all through a controller and all the rest of that. So it's a cool fixture. I, I like the the finish on the Smart 8. It's a lot nicer than than sort of the, the Fold 8 or the Easy 8, the other two fixtures I tested from them. I was pretty impressed by the performance too. It did better than I sort of thought in, in certain ways and better than the Fold 8. I thought it was going to be more similar to the Fold 8, but it really did better. And I've decided, I'm talking about setting up that, that 4x4 tent. I'm going to keep this one, <laughs> this Smart 8 <laughs> I just tested yesterday, because you can run it at 60% power and get really good distribution, close to 1,000 in the middle, really all the way around in the middle, and still up around 550, 600 in the corners um, at 60% power hmm. and getting like 2.55 micromoles per watt. Right, getting more efficient at that point. Really efficient at that point. Um, really excellent coverage. One of the one of the advantages of having a light that's sort of bigger than or designed to cover a bigger space is it really would cover a smaller space well, dim. So it's meant for a five by five coverage area, but it, it almost is four by four. So when you dim it down and, and cover it in that smaller space, the edge readings are almost Whoa. as good as the the center. That's very cool. And I know that like, and push back if I'm wrong about this, but you take a look at these new fixtures, you take a look at the ones that are like, you know, approved by you, people like Shane who test these things. They're all pretty close in that range of efficiency and stuff, right? So, so to get the smart, which has a lower price point. And then, like I said, man, I really think down the road, the difference is going to be the usability, the interface. Yeah. Cause they're all pretty close. Like, I know you get into the par map shit and you'll be like, yo, I might not recommend this brand. But as far as the high end ones, like they're all pretty damn close to each other, right? Yeah. And, you know, like the, the distributional differences among the, the bar array fixtures, like how, how well they distribute light is minor. I mean, they all do a pretty good job of distributing light. Right. Some of them do, do a, a slightly better job, but that's one of the main performance features that you're looking at. The other is efficiency. And yeah, they're all, all pretty close. So then it comes down to uh, a matter of cost. Now, when you put all that together, you, you can certainly tease out some better values and some some not good values. Sure. Well, certainly the thing about the, the Medicro fixtures, and I mean, this has been true ever since I started testing it. I was so blown away when I tested the Fold 8 at first. It was 36 cents per micromole. When like the next best fixture I had tested at that point was like 49 or 50 cents per exactly. micromole. Exactly. And that's because um, of the price point. That's because of the, the several hundred dollars. Yeah. So yeah. it comes down to, to price point and understanding sort of what you're getting for that. And that's why it's important to understand the performance and understand the efficiency. You understand something about the components of a light. So, you know, like the diodes aren't just being massively overdriven. Although generally that would show up in, in the efficiency data as well. Hmm. I definitely think, you know, I'm always surprised by every time I test a fixture, I, I, I never know what I'm going to think about it until I'm done testing it. I can't even start like sort of writing my review or anything on it until I'm done with the tests and, and sort of have time to analyze the tests. And there's always something that it's either better than I expected or not as good as I expected or sort of damn near surprising. And it's interesting to me how much that's still the case. Damn. I was pretty surprised how high I had to raise this smart eight in a four by four space at an 80% dimmer. Um, the hanging height was 66 centimeters to get uh, a 1000 micromole density in a four by four space. So to get it down to sort of at 80% on the dimmer and that was just, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I wouldn't have predicted that it would have been that high. Wow. Power, powerful fixture for the lay people. Yeah. Well, 
even based on the 60% reading. So it, at 60%, it was pretty much at that thousand at, at 12 inches. But the edges and the corners had some room for light to sort of spread into them. But so I went all the way from 30 up to, to 66 centimeters to keep the same PPFD, the same maximum PPFD going, going from, to 80%. from 60% to 80%. Okay. Yeah, I follow. Wow. Very, very interesting, man. Yeah. And every time you sort of run a test like that and, you know, I see how the light behaves and see how it spreads into different parts of the maps at different heights. You know, you can always sort of figure out why it happened that way. This is the stuff that I get off on. This is what I really enjoy about doing the light test is interpreting the results and and thinking about them. But to get back to your your basic point, yeah, most of them do a pretty good job of sort of getting decent coverage out. You're looking at, you know, some differences in terms of what spectrum they may provide or sort of how much they supplement the spikes in in the red and far red. You're looking at sort of a, a nexus of things in terms of diet, brand, quality, number, and efficiency all sort of relate to each other that, you know, goes together with sort of how long the fixture will last um, and how efficient it's going to run. Yeah, that and the, the the distribution, I think, are the main things to sort of understand how much how much light a, a fixture produces, and then you know you divide it by the cost, and so those numbers that I always talk about, and they're usually in the the pennies per micromole. Like the this Smart Eight came to twenty nine point eight cents per micromole, so we round up to thirty cents per micromole, which is now the the sort of the record. A lot of fixtures are now in the 40 to 50 cents per micromole or whatever. And that's a really good way, I think, to think about sort of the value of the different lights yeah. once you're getting. But you do have to make sure that the I other like boxes that. are checked. Well, I mean, and, you know, not not a full episode of Medic Grow promo. Code Grow, <laughs> yeah. pro, code Growcast. Uh, I like how they stack on deals, too. So grab one. I can understand that lower price being a huge benefit. But I will say this while we're on the topic again. Um, if all those things get equal, right? Like I'm thinking about the future of grow lights. I'm right. thinking about uh, if we accomplish our goal and get, you know, everyone overgrowing the nation, all these home growers, man, I think the light company that does it best is going to be the one that has that easy to use iPad style. Like what about grandma who's growing, right? Like we need, I'm sure yeah. there are a lot of people who love to dive into the PPFD, Coco, but also there's going to be people who just want a button for sunset mode, a button for flower, a button for veg. Yeah, they want something that works. Is that where we're headed? They want something that works. You know, I think a lot of people that like watch my videos don't even want, I mean, there's some people that nerd out on the numbers like I do, right? But there's some people that just want to be told like, yeah, no, this is what you're looking for in a grow light. And and this, this yeah. works, right? And this is the density that you need. It's not that they don't care. It's that they don't really want to... We understand the the science of PPFD and all of that. That that's totally understandable. I still do think that that you know they want to know is this one was this a good one that that's going to give enough light or or you know what what they usually say is be bright enough and and that's not really the right question, but I understand what they mean. But yeah, they want something that that's easy to set up. I think that that's another consideration, right? Like. Is this something that I can physically sort of maneuver and manipulate, or is it going to be too big and I'm going to need help? So that, and then is it easy to run and use? And do I know how to run and use it? Intuitive. Do I know sort of how high to hang it and how powerful to, to run it? And I, I try to explain that about the, the lights that, that I test. I, I, you know, it would be nice if manufacturers would provide more of that, but it would also, be a little bit hard to believe oftentimes sort of because manufacturers have such a marketing angle that they they need to sort of drive in their materials that you know good honest advice about how to to run the fixtures can take a back seat to sort of the marketing imperatives of making the fixtures look good that's a good point yeah i just wonder how far we are from this like vertically integrated grow system where you're no longer changing a timer or even necessarily like altering your, your what we know as a controller to switch to flower. It's literally just an icon button, like an app. I think that we're just, uh, you know what I mean? Or, well, this, yeah, or, or this your light. Makes the first picture that I've tested that almost has that built right in, right? They right. have a switch. You can leave the timer on off if you want it on 24 hours. 
or you said that there's a built-in timer. You set it on the 18 hour setting and it'll go on for 18 hours and off for six. Veg button, flower button. Yeah. And then there's a 12 switch. So it, it requires a little bit of interpretation, but that, that functionality is built into the light. And I think that for, for growers that are running single fixture grows like that for home growers, I, I, th- I do think having that. There's a line though, you know, and it took a while for like home theater systems, home entertainment systems to cross this line. I think you and I probably grew up through most of this where, you know, people were having 17 different remote controls to control each individual <laughs> appliance. And if you wanted to watch TV, you had to like change the setting on three different appliances and turning them all on. And there was a big sort of curve to overcome before people were willing to, to engage with that. You're so right. Yeah. And that's the same thing with, with sort of automating and integrating a grow. I've been talking to DJ from GrowTech, um, who's designing this automated monitoring system. And it, it, it had me thinking about a, a similar thing. Like people want this, but, you know, it's something that, that's going to ostensibly simplify things by making it easier. It also has to be kind of easy to set up and easy to understand. and connect with the other systems that you're using. And if it's not, that's really going to sort of limit the audience for for those products or that style or that method or whatever it is. And products, systems that, that address that, I certainly think there's a market for it. Yeah, man. It's interesting to see, you know, how smart are these lights going to get? It's, it's gonna, is it going to alert you that um, you're too close to the canopy? Is it going to alert you you know what I mean? Like, I, I yeah, pretty interesting to to extrapolate that. Yeah, it is you know some of the new controllers do some interesting things, like the thermal shutdown. Right, that if the the temperature gets too hot in the grow space, it'll turn off the lights. Right, and the idea behind that is primarily to save the plants, right? Because the assumption is it's getting too hot because some aspect of the climate control system failed. And if it gets too hot under intense light, the lights are also adding heat. So the lights are like, hey, look, you're having problems. We're going to just stop contributing to them and we're going to turn ourselves off. You know, or going to, should the lights control the climate control system? Um, If you're going to automate something like watering, should the watering system control the lights or should the lights control the watering system? Or should all of this be controlled by some third party controller that, that does all of this? And how do you have all these separate systems sort of integrated. So it's easy to program. You don't need to have like a 60 page programming manual or something, right? That it can be done like through an app and an intuitive process for, for growers to set up. Exactly. The Apple TV of home grow. I mean, it's going to come. I just wonder who's going to do it. Yeah. And I, I think that, I think that there is a barrier to entry in terms of growers a, not knowing what they need in terms of equipment to get set up and then not knowing exactly how to use it. And yeah, I mean, that's a lot of what we do with our our platforms and sort of the kind of information that we try to put out there is to overcome both those problems as well. I'd like to hope so. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'd certainly like to hope so. Yeah, because this is, a, a you know, it's a pastime with a lot of new participants in it every day. And, you know... It's often difficult to get in good information through some traditional channels. You know, if you think about it, like another pastime or something, like a lot of people take up golf um, and you would go someplace and ask a professional to teach you how to be a golfer. You wouldn't just take the recommendations of the manufacturers of the equipment. And to a certain extent, you'd listen to them, right? But you would understand that they're they're conflicted or something, but just the market for cannabis cultivation doesn't, isn't as mature and developed in that sense. There aren't sort of experts that you can easily consult with or or classes that people can take and the information that's available online is is somewhat sketchy. I hear exactly what you're saying. We need to take a lesson from the golfing industry. Loud and clear, Coco. Um, <clears throat> no, speaking of taking... That would be cool. I'd like to be like a cannabis pro and have people come over for like half hour lessons where I teach them how to fertigate. Listen, there's not enough golf carts in cultivation, okay? I'm looking to change that. You need to be riding on golf carts everywhere. Everywhere, uh, you know, everywhere that's feasible. I think a, a psychologist would have a, a field day trying to figure out 
where are these analogies? I, I mean, I'm sort of always flabbergasted by where my analogies can <laughs> come from. I don't have like a whole list of these things pre-thought out, but just the most bizarre things like likening that, you know, grow instruction to being a golf pro. The other day I was thinking about, I often try to think of different analogies for photons in, in a grow space. And I was thinking about a rock bouncing down the inside of a well. And I really like that one now. I think <laughs> a, a rock bouncing down the inside of a well. I'm like, where does this shit come from? Yeah, you know, now that I say it again, I do really like that one. That is the analogy, baby. The fact that you sit around and try to think of more apt analogies for photons, and that's how you spend your day. Oh, I have tons of them now, though. I mean, the the frosting on, a, on the cake is still one of my go-tos in terms of explaining sort of photons and density and, and how light works in a space. I liken it to frosting on a cake, which is really it. You know, I mean, without saying anything more, kind of a stretch. But they're rock bouncing down the well. Uh, this relates to, to how hanging high affects sort of light in a gross space. Basically, it doesn't. So, like, the rock still gets to the bottom of the well, right? Like, where mm -hmm. your plants are. It, it might bounce off the walls more. If the well's a really deep well, it might bounce off the walls more. But assuming that you have a gross space surrounded by reflective walls, almost all of the light is going to get to the bottom of the well. Right. Nothing else really happens to it. Now, each time the rock hits the wall, like a tiny bit kind of like chips off. And that would be like the reflective losses. And that, in a light analogy, would be sort of the heat that dissipated. But like most of the rock <laughs> gets to the bottom of the well. Oh, fascinating. So it's like a softer rock. It's chipping every time it, it hits just a little it bit. Just, it, you know, it's actually not a very soft rock. I mean, we're losing, you know, 10% maybe on, okay. on each bounce. So, yeah, it, somewhat soft rock. And most of the rocks <laughs> don't hit the wall at all. They'll just drop straight, you know. And you'd have to imagine rocks that don't collide with each other. So if you're dropping like a whole bucket of rocks down the well, which is kind of what we're doing, they're not going to collide with each other. <laughs> like that just doesn't, it's hard for two photons to sort of hit each well, other in space. It's not a perfect analogy, but I like it. It's not, Yeah, in that sense. So if you can imagine that they just uh, avoid each other, there's no sort of chain reactions where rocks start hitting each other and throwing other ones off their trajectory that they were otherwise on. But if you dumped a whole bucket of rocks down the well, some of them are going to bounce off the walls. A few of them may bounce off the walls several times because they get a funny ricochet and they start just back and forthing it down the well, right? Most of them just going to drop to the bottom of the well. So, you know, when you're thinking you lose 10% on each bounce, the, most of the photons don't even bounce. Oh. Most of the photons fall directly. Well, I guess that makes sense too. Yeah, it, it depends on the space and other things now. So the analogy kind of holds, and I think it's one way to help understand what happens. If the well is only a foot deep, like your light's only a foot above the plants and you drop a rock, it's just going to land right there, right? Um, if you drop a whole bucket of rocks, you're just going to have a pile of rocks right there. But if the well is 100 feet deep and you drop a whole pile of rocks, you're going to have a really sort of even distribution of rocks at the bottom of that well, right? You're not going to have just one pile. That's what happens when you raise the hanging height in the light. That makes is that the sense. light becomes better distributed. The vast majority of it still gets to the canopy, but it's better distributed than it would have been if you had been closer. I totally understand that through your analogy. Thanks to Dr. Coco's analogy. Yeah, sorry. It makes a whole lot of sense. So we went from an, a, a totally unrelated analogy to <laughs> my pontifications of analogies in general. And then yes. I, I, I launched into that one. But yeah, that's just, this is the weird that's way. That's a good one, works. man. Anyways, it's all related, hopefully, I like to some it. stuff that we were supposed to talk about. It's related to something. No, uh, that was that was definitely, um, again, you, you really, it really helps us when you talk about these different things or you know, the way photons behave at an angle and or, or like skipping off, you know, a stone skipping off water. All of these things help people like me understand. So we do appreciate it. We were I had a good lead in. I had a good segue to this. But I mean, listen, I'm just going to tell it like it is. But, but, but we're, over 20, we're over 20 minutes in and I, we're now starting the main topic of this episode. Hey, that's how we love Dr. Cohen. Hey, I think that's pretty good. For yeah, us, it's Jordan. actually a, yeah, it's actually a new record, I think. No, I love <laughs> it, man. You know, I love it. 
We'll be right back with Dr. Coco, but before that, Plant Revolution, baby, the makers of Great White. What wonderful supporters they are of this show. We're doing some giveaways here in just a bit. And you guys love these products, man. You got the Great White Myco. This is their Myco powder. Lots of Great Mycos on the market, but Great White is an OG in the game. Not to mention, I believe it's water soluble. I didn't know that about the Great White Myco. You can mix it into water. I need to verify this, but I just saw a a a rep recommending this. So there you go, everybody. There's also the liquid myco, if you just rather grab that, that's the orca, and it has a few strains of beneficial bacteria in there as well. There's a couple little goodies in that orca that really make it my favorite. I found myself applying that this last run more than anything else. Um, Also the myco chum, which is food for your microbes. It's a high quality molasses uh, combined with a few extra goodies in there, some micronutrients, a couple extra inputs, secret sauce to make your plants extra vigorous, extra happy, and feed those crobes, baby. That's why the plants are praying because you're feeding the beneficial biology, the beneficial fungi, the beneficial bacteria in your soil with Great White's Myco Chum. Find them in your local hydro store. Find them all over the place. They're great friends of the show. Try the King Crab too. Such a clean product. I love it all. Again, the Great White line by Plant Revolution. Cannot say enough good things about these folks. All right, let's get back to it with Dr. Coco. I had you on today for a specific reason, man. We're doing this. Um, we're doing this breeder feature February, right? We're talking about. Yeah. We're talking about uh, lineage. We're talking about testing a lot. Testing has been coming up. How does traditional ag breeding uh, differ from what we do here as cannabis breeders? I, I don't think we, we've fully established what we're doing here on the breeding side of it. You know, a lot of what what goes on in in cannabis breeding, and this is not to disparage any cannabis breeder by any stretch of the imagination is more akin to sort of traditional crop breeding where farmers sort of um, either incidentally or intentionally create crosses of their preferred varieties and save the seeds to to plant in the the following season. It, It seems to be a fairly haphazard approach, and then you end up with uh, a lot of uh, progeny, a lot of sort of potential seeds, and then you you may test those out, right, for, to see which ones you like. Most sort of scientific breeding programs take a, a really deliberative approach, whether they're going after sort of open pollinated varieties or hybrid varieties. And most breeding for crops is with hybrid varieties. The hybridization, sort of creating the, the parent lines for hybrid strains is a, a really kind of a different process. And that gets back to large scale trials again. I always wonder how much to get into sort of the, the understanding of hybridization and that style of breeding, since it's kind of very different to what is being done or even the goal of, of sort of a lot of cannabis breeding. In a hybrid breeding program, or if you're going to make hybrid seeds, you want to get two unrelated strains that, that are homozygotic for most factors, and then you cross them. And when you cross them, you get a, a fairly stable and predictable phenotype and genotype. There's no way necessarily to predict that, at least there hadn't been for a long time in terms of sort of which parents. So in corn breeding, what they they literally do is they self-pollinate plants, self-pollinate plants that have particular traits that they think may be desirable and uh, self-pollinate them for at least seven generations. So to the S7 generation. And what that does, the the series of repeated crosses, is it inbreeds that line and basically makes most genes homozygotic, meaning that that plant that's been crossed to itself seven times will have the same copy of every gene at each allele or of every allele at each locus. So like basic genetics, basic Mendelian genetics, where we have, um, you know, one copy from your mother and one copy from your father for any trait, for any allele. 
if your father, say, is A, B, and your mother has an A and a B, then the children, about half of the children will have A, B, just like their parents. About 25% of those, of those kids will be A, A, because they would have gotten the A from, from both parents. And about 25% of the kids will be B, B. Mm-hmm. Now, when you multiply that across thousands and thousands of different genes and loci for, for these, these chromosomes to pair up, you know, that's what creates difference. That's why you look different than your siblings. That's why, you know, the same two parents can have children that, that look, act, behave, have different sets of genes. They're not genetically identical. But if your mom had AA and your dad had BB, every single child would be AB. Every single child would get an A from the mother and a B from the father. Oh, wow. Right? So when your parents are homozygotic, meaning that they have two of the same copies, that's the same gene, at, at, you know, both copies are the same. So they have A and an A. They don't have an A and a B. If they're homozygotic and you cross them with another homozygotic individual, the offspring will be heterozygotic and predictable. So every single offspring will be AB. A, B, A, B. Now, there's a lot of things in genetics that have heterozygotic advantage. There's a whole term for it, heterosis, which refers to hybrid vigor. And that's because there's a lot of sort of deleterious genes that are recessive. Things that are really bad if you get two copies of them. Mm. So like a good example from, from humans is sickle cell anemia. It's a, a disease common in the Mediterranean region um, in Northern Africa, because it, if you're heterozygotic, if you have one copy of the sickle cell trait, but not two, then you have an advantage against malaria. You're less likely to develop malaria. You're less likely to catch malaria. And if you do catch malaria, you're less likely to be severely ill from malaria because it alters the shape of your red blood cells enough that malaria has a hard time attacking your blood. That's an advantage for heterozygotic people. If you don't have any of the traits, then you have normal blood cells and you can get malaria. If you have two sickling traits, then you have full-blown sickle cell anemia and it's probably going to kill you. Um, so being homozygotic for it is bad. Not having it at all is bad if you live in a malarial zone, but being heterozygotic for it has an advantage. The only way you can predictably get heterozygotic offspring is if one of the parent was homozygotic for the deleterious or for that, that trait. And the other parent didn't have it at all. So sort of understanding those basic structures of genetics and, and what they're going for, what you do in, in a typical hybrid breeding program is you inbreed two different lines, two different unrelated plants. You inbreed them through a series of generations. It takes about seven um, in order to get a fully homozygotic parent. That homozygotic parent is often a weak, sickly individual. Hmm. Uh, It doesn't have a lot of vigor. It often doesn't have the trait that you're even going for anymore that you were trying to breed for because that trait that you're, you're trying to breed for may have only existed in the heterozygotic state. Sometimes plants become sort of some of the deleterious recessives mean that they're not viable. And after five or six crossings, some of the, the individuals aren't viable. Um, some of the, the parent strains for the corn seeds that, that farmers grow today are weak, sickly plants. But you get them to that seventh state step, as long as they're still viable, then you cross them to another plant that's gone through that same process. And doing that inbreeding 
to create homozygosity, it, it basically makes everybody have two copies of the same trait at every locus, for, at every chromosome. So you, you have AA at one and then BB and then CC and then BB and then AA and then BB at, at every site. And when you split that apart during meiosis, the sexual reproduction to create the, the gametes to, to do the, the reproduction in plants, it would be the, the pollen or the, the, uh, the female flower. You, you get the same copy on each side when, when those chromosomes split. And then they recombine with another homozygotic set and every single individual from, from that cross will be identical and heterozygotic instead of homozygotic like the parents were. That creates predictable strains. So farmers in Iowa can buy a bag of seed and plant it on one day and know that those plants are all going to mature at about the same rate, that the ears of corn are all going to develop at about the same height on the plant, and that they're all going to be about the same you know, size and all the rest of that. They can establish that real consistency because the individual seeds are genetically identical to each other. They're identical not through sort of a cloning process. They're identical because they're, they're the, the F1 generation from two P1 plants that are inbred and homozygotic. Okay, I got to shut up now because I've been going for a really No, I think I definitely have a better understanding now. So that's a traditional program for like a hybrid seed, like hybrid maize and, you know, soybeans, wheat, what have you. Most of these crops are grown that way. One of the reasons that seed companies like hybridization is because that heterosis, which is the hybrid vigor, essentially those plants where the, the mother had AA and the father had BB, they're all going to be ABs. None of them are going to have a deleterious recessive allele. And the, the weeding out of the deleterious recessive expression creates a, a healthier, usually more vigorous organism. This is something that biologists notice across all walks of, of life, generally, um, across different organisms, across animals, plants, bacteria, all sorts of things. When, sure. when you cross to distantly related organisms, the offspring Our generally goodness. have a certain advantage. They, they have more vigor. That is fascinating. Why don't we try to tie it back to what's going on in cannabis, though, then? Because it sounds like that's not really occurring anywhere like a 7BX corn cross? Well, I'm, I'm sort of getting there. The okay. advantage to the breeders to doing this is they can control the parents. Those parent lines that they use to make like the wheat seeds and the corn seeds are high, closely guarded trade secrets and intellectual property. And farmers aren't successful at saving their seeds because the, the F2 generation lacks the hybrid vigor. So the reason that the entire seed market for wheat and corn and soybeans and every other commercial sort of valuable crop has, has gone the route of hybridization is because you can control the genetics. You can, even if you give farmers the seeds, they're not going to have success saving those seeds and replanting them for the next year. It, they'll, I mean, they'll grow, they'll be viable, but they won't be as good and they won't be as consistent. And therefore, it makes more sense for the farmers to just buy them again, fresh each year from the yep. seed supplier. And that's, that's sort of the angle in cannabis too. I, I do expect that process to come into cannabis breeding. I do expect somebody to create a highly successful hybridized cannabis plant done through that inbridization and cross and they're going to land on something. It's got to be a process that happens almost like striking gold because you're going to take two sickly plants that, that don't look like they're going to have much potential and cross them and, and be hoping to sort of strike gold with it. But I think there's an opportunity for that in cannabis anyways. And if you created those seeds, you'd be able to control them. People could still clone that, but they wouldn't be able to make seeds that had the same characteristics as the parents. Wow. The other thing that, that this 
sort of getting into the genetics relates to cannabis is the process of selfing and sort of the process of creating seeds to be aware that, you know, an S1 or an S2 is not the same as the parent. Right. It, that would be, there's this genetic recombination that, that takes place. Yeah. Why is that? Well, say you have A and B on a simple or simple genetics example, right? You have an A and a B and you are going to be both the egg and sperm donor. So when your genes split to make the sperm, say the sperm ends up with a B. Okay. You get either two sperm. One gets an A, one gets a B. You also get two eggs. One gets an A, one gets a B. Oh, wow. But if, the, if your B sperm matches with your B egg, you now have an offspring that's a BB. Okay. Whereas the parent was an AB. That makes a lot of sense. It, differentiating between the seeds, therefore leading to variation. Right. So when you're both the pollen and the, the egg donor in that case, right, then, you know, your genes are recombining in, in that classic Mendelian sense where if you don't have the, the same gene at that locus, um, you can get that 50, 25, 25 split. Wow. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, I guess I, yeah, that's just a really good way to, to paint that picture. Yeah, I think that good. I think we got to a point that hopefully a lot of, a, a lot of, you know, breeders or people that are picking up cannabis breeding can benefit from there and sort of understanding what happens when you self things. You're recombining the genetics. And unless it's homozygotic, you're going to have a mix in the offspring. For any given trait, about 50, assuming a heterozygotic parent, if you self it, for any given trait, only 50% of the offspring will share that same genetics. Wow. Will share that same sort of combination. That is fascinating. And you're right. I've heard, I've heard growers say, you know, I, uh, I don't have a cut, but I have an S1. And it's like, man, that is not the same thing. I mean, maybe if you, if you have no other choice, right? The thing right. about an S1 is you can throw it in a drawer for decades. You don't have to keep it alive. So maybe if you get a lot of them, right. maybe one day you can hunt something very, very similar. Right, but man, treating it like a clone. And maybe you're thinking to yourself, well, 50% of the plants are going to be just like the, the parent, but no, That's per trait. just for that one gene, there's, exactly. there's thousands of genes. So each one of them, you know, and, and having the one that lines up exactly with the exact same genetic profile as the parent is going to be astronomical odds. You can get really close. You know, some of them will have the same combinations of genes that matter or that matter the most. Yes. But yeah, you're not going to, you're not going to get, this would be like asking a person to sort of reproduce with themselves. How many times do you have to do that before you're going to get somebody that looks exactly like you? I don't know, man. is exactly like you. I I reproduce with myself a lot. When Mrs. River is out of town, (laughs) it gets, you know. (laughs) I was about to say, it's too bad humans can't do that. I'm like, no, no, it's not too bad. It's actually a really, really good thing that humans can't do that. Um, no, I know exactly what you're saying, man. And that makes me think that these people who, I mean, I don't want to name any names here, but these people who like S1 other people's work and actually just build a brand off of it, like openly, yes. hey, get these genetics. It's an S1 of it. And I'm being open about it. Those aren't the same genetics. It's just, it is an S1. It's a, it's a technically a cross. It's just another cross. Right. Right. And some of the, the traits, it, it's a cross with itself, but recombination happens there. And if there's enter, any heterozygosity, which there always is going to be in, the, in these sort of, you know, highline favored trait or favored varieties, that's going to get recombined. So if that favored variety was an AB, not all of the cell S1s are going to be ABs. And multiply that by a thousand and put that in a blender so it's all random. And you're going to realize that, yeah, every single S1 is going to be different than the parent. There's not going to be any S ones. I mean, there would we could run the math on it, but there'd be like you know, it depends on the number of genes that that you're tracking for this, and each one of them you're having a fifty percent chance of having the same as the parent. So, you know, astronomical odds to get something that was exactly the same. But like I said, you're going to get similar. It's going to be from the same mix of of sort of genetics, right? It's not going to be you know, a totally different type of plant at that point. But 
Yeah, I think these are important things. And, you know, for any open pollinated variety, which is a sort of uh, strains that breed true sort of within their own population, when, when crossed within their own population, that they, they breed generally true to, to type. There's just a, a sort of different approach to eliminating the deleterious recessives from populations like that. They tend to be selected out instead of almost selected for in, in sort of the, the inbreeding style of, of breeding. Wow. And you can create, and this is the way that most traditional farmers sort of create varieties by selectively you know, regrowing their favorite varieties and weeding out the the bad ones, the ones that are obviously, you know, runty for whatever reason. Oftentimes those reasons are, you know, a deleterious recessive allele that was expressed in that, that individual that you need to eliminate that from basically the genetic pool. Those open pollinating varieties also always sort of require that maintenance. There's always going to be you know, a couple of bad apples, a couple of underperformers that need to be weeded out. But that's the way that farmers traditionally did breeding for millennia. And, and that's the way that all of the crops that we're growing now, especially the ones that are hybrids now, were originally domesticated. That's where most of the, the strains and families of strains that we're familiar with in cannabis were originally domesticated. Those open pollinating varieties have genetic diversity they have heterozygosity, but they're sort of selected. The, the deleterious traits are selected out when they occur. This inbreeding kind of breeding practice, it results in, like you said, something that's uniform, something that's easy to distribute. Is that something that we even want? Certainly not as growers, as consumers, that makes a lot of sense, right? But what, what does that look like when you- If it's fire. Right. It, I think it's the, the if it's fire part that, that's going to- that's why the seed companies put a lot of money into R and D for this, and and don't have sort of a, you know, it, they understand it's a long game. Yeah. We, we have cuts though. We already have cuts. We do very well with them in the cannabis industry. What's the benefit of doing this long breeding process? Well, all the advantages that the clones provide, except in a seed. So, uniformity of expression. You know, not having different phenotypes of a strain or whatever. Yeah, it seems so like a lot of work. For, especially for commercial facilities <laughs> that you could guarantee consistent product. And uh, again, it has to be fire in order for anybody to want it to be consistent. But if it was fire, I think that, you know, having that consistency, having the, the timing of it, all of those things, it would be sort of, you know, the advantages that people talk about running clones and they know what they're going to get. They've grown the same plant for a long time. They know what it means, what it takes, how it responds to different things. All of those sort of idiosyncrasies would be identical. I think there's a lot of sort of reward for that, you know, probably more in the commercial space, but also in the home grower space. From the breeder angle, it's the only way within breeding to be able to actually sort of own the intellectual property. When you own those parent plants, you own the intellectual property. Right. It's not sort of, you know, a patent somewhere. It's in a plant and you're growing that plant. That plant is your intellectual property. And controlling the physical possession of those parent lines to be, have, you know, have the only male and the only female that can create this particular seed that has that has value advantages from the breeder side. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Identifying the lines is tough. And, you know, in most big agricultural sort of breeding programs, they do the pasta at the wall technique for this. I mean, they start a lot of plants, they self a lot of plants out, and you don't know what you're going to get at the end of it. You can't judge it based on the, the sort of growth characteristics of the inbred plant. You have to wait until you get it back to the, the hybrid. And, you know, a lot of casual breeders would give up at that stage because by the, the fifth or sixth um, back cross, it, you know, you might be displaying some weird traits. Looking at a garbage plant. You're going to be, 
what you're doing is you're forcing the plant to become homozygotic, which is going to force it to express some deleterious recessive traits that, that it's accumulated. So it might start herming on you. It might do other things. And you're like, no, I don't want to do that. You got to like push through that understanding that <laughs> this, this plant has a genetic expressions that aren't going to be in the F1 generation after you cross it to an unrelated plant. Really interesting stuff, man. Again, I, uh, there, there's a lot of testing talk that's gone on this month. I'm just trying to expose the listener to as many different angles as possible. Yeah, well, I, and I think the whole Mendelian genetics thing is another reason why testing is so important. When you do any cross, unless you are totally sure that the parents are homozygotic, you know, there's going to be variety in that F1 generation. Totally. And it's important to sort of understand what the variety is and what the range of, of sort of potentials are and sort of doing those, those grow tests, see how consistent it is, um, you know, is the genetic diversity that's going to exist really important in such a way that maybe you should explain that or, or continue working on that? Or is it a pretty night, you know, tight knit range where, yeah, I see some differences between some of these plants, but they all share a lot of the, the characteristics right. that we're going to advertise that's in this strain. No, that's, that is a really good point, man. We could go much further on this. I want to get your take on one more thing. And then unfortunately we have to wrap it up due to time constraints here. Okay. Did you see the dark heart nursery? triploid cannabis not being able to pollinate have you seen this have you heard about this tell me you've seen this i, I think i I'm, I'm, yeah it, it's ringing a bell let me just pull I'm, up the article here uh dark heart announces world's first intrinsically seedless cannabis for commercial growers the the trademark is pistol guard seeds it's a triploid which i listen i'm going to say this and then you're going to correct me my understanding is that triploid plants what can't be pollinated the same way. So you don't have to worry about like pollen drifting over it's pollen proof cannabis, essentially. Okay. The development of triploid seed varieties has been a huge step forward in many commercial crops, including watermelon, banana, and apples, uh -huh. it's like seedless watermelon. You know what I mean? Uh huh. And you can also, you can also control the genetics that way, right? I, well, you should be able to. Yeah, no, I'm not familiar with this from dark art nursery. So that that's, that's an interesting yeah, approach. I think next we, episode. I'm trying to place our conversation on this. We were talking about oh, different paths to potentially make seedless varieties, right? Is that the conversation? I think we may have. Yeah, that, that does ring a bell. But this is brand new. I think this dropped. Uh, yeah, this dropped January 31st. We got to tease it, man. Well, I'll shoot you this article. and um, Yeah, so I'm wondering how they deployed that, particularly in, in this so everything we've been talking about has been, you know, you get one set from your your mother, one set from your father, and that creates, you know, if you get the same copy, you're homozygotic. If you get two different copies, you're heterozygotic, all of that. That, uh, uh, as soon as diploidy, right, that you're getting one copy from each parent. So triploid is you have a third set of character of, of chromosomes, Um you would essentially like have a third parent um, sort of think of it that way, but that's not exactly how it works. So hmm. I'm, I'm wondering sort of how they deploy. It, it makes sense that, that that would be a method to cut off reproduction. How they deployed, how they deployed the deployed. Are they deploying the, the triploid, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know, man. We'll have to. We'll have uh, to so see what's I'll, get, up. I'll, I'll have to look into that. Um, but that's basically what I can what I can say about that off the bat. I do think that there are ways to to breed for seedless varieties. Yeah. Usually by yeah going after female reproduction angle on it. That's always been the, the weird part to me about cannabis. It's the only crop that I'm aware about that growers generally try to get seedless by eliminating any and all sources of pollen. <laughs> Most of the time that we, we breed for that, or if we bred for it, it would, it would go through the, the female reproduction and making that sterile or making that more impotent. So that is a funny thought. That is a really funny thought. Yeah, it's a funny thought I've had a lot. And it is an angle that 
I think there's room for, in terms of sort of advanced breeding. And there's a, a whole lot of, of stuff that they could do with genetic engineering and with CRISPR and stuff. And it, it'll be interesting to see if that's the direction a big segment of the cannabis market takes. Oh, for sure. There's a big pushback to doing some of those, you know, big engineering projects with, with crops. And I'm wondering if there's overlap between the, how much the overlap is between the sort of the anti um, engineering movement and the cannabis movement or how much sort of agreement there could be is that that does sort of open up different angles to what cannabis would be in the future. If somebody really engineers it as a fundamentally different plant that has significant advantages over it and is able to own the the genetics of that improvement, that could completely transform what we know of of sort of the cannabis seeds and, and genetics market. Hey, man, the more the merrier, do your thing. As long as growers, home growers can get their hands on seeds and genetics easily, I'm fine. Do whatever you're going to do with your CRISPRs and your diploids and triploids and whatever. They're all yours. Just make sure that the growers can get seeds and I'm fine with that. Yeah. And, you know, I think there's always going to be a market for people that wanted to do that want to do it differently and want to be sort of more connected to their breeders and all the rest of that, too. So no matter how cannabis it evolves, I think there's there's going to be a, a healthy craft cannabis market and growers for that. It'll be interesting to see if if those values are sort of able to be more dominant in the industry writ large, though. Can we do an episode on CRISPR, like and and it like more about how it's uh, how it could impact the cannabis world? Sure, absolutely. Let's At the that. great risk of um, recommending another podcast, <laughs> the guys at Radio Lab did an episode on CRISPR probably three years ago uh-huh. that was really, really good. I, I sort of like the podcast approach to it. So if you want a good primer on Ooh. CRISPR and what it is and how it would potentially be used in something like cannabis, although they don't get into that directly, you can easily connect the dots and you want to sort of know what all these people are talking about. I've been thinking about that. I should recommend that podcast. So I'm sure you can, you can look it up, but radio lab um, about three years ago, I'd say maybe, maybe more than that. I don't know. It's a good show. It's a really good episode. It definitely holds up and it, it will introduce you to what CRISPR is and why it's important. But yeah, I'd be happy to to talk a little bit more about that. Um, You know, we can, pick up some of the threads that we started laying down here with some of these other things too. I I always feel like I get carried away on something that I think is interesting and hopefully the audience does too. (laughs) But then I feel like semi guilty (laughs) leaving these shows. I'm like, Oh shit. I didn't talk about what Jordan wanted me to talk about today. No, not at all, dude. I got, well, let me be candid with you. This is one of the greatest episodes ever. I feel, especially when it comes to the science side, you know, when we have you on, that's what we're looking for. I feel like I have uh, walked away from this one learning or at least like thinking differently about stuff than, than maybe ever before. So it was a great show, man. It was a fantastic show. Excellent. Excellent. I enjoyed it. Uh, I, as always, Jordan would be happy to come back. Fuck uh, yeah. You Growcast know. TV next, baby. Get a, get up and yeah, membership, we could, do, we could do some Growcast TV. I'm going to be doing, I, I talked about it at the, the top that I was testing the, the Smart Aid. I'm going to be doing a premiere for that probably around the time that this episode drops. So uh, I'll do a giveaway um, on that. Come and, and check out my YouTube channel. That's some fun YouTube stuff. But I enjoyed the the Growcast TV thing too. So we should we should try to make that more consistent. Oh yeah, man, they love having you. And um, yeah, like Coco said, stay tuned for that premiere. Get in on that Medic Grow promo um, or the giveaway rather. Also the promo code Growcast and CocoForCannabis.com. Of course, all the challenges. Go find them there. Coco for Cannabis on Instagram. And yeah, stay tuned. Stay tuned for some bonus shit. Absolutely. We're about to start gearing up for the spring auto flower challenge, which will be the next one starting on 420. Get your grow calendars lined up to join us for the spring auto flower challenge. Fuck yeah. All right. There you go, everybody. That's it for today. That is all.
This is Jordan River and Dr. Coco signing off. And yeah, happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Oh, yes. Happy Valentine's Day. And uh, we will see you soon. Be my Valentine up at the Cultivator's Cup, baby. That's coming up soon. Stay tuned for everything going on, Growcast-wise. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. This is Dr. Coco and Jordan River saying be safe and grow smarter. Grow in love, everyone. That's all, everybody. That's our show for today. Thank you so much. You want more content? We've got so much up at membership. That's right. The Order of Cultivation is our membership, our secret society of growers. You got to get in and see what it's all about. I am refunding people who join today only, so you can check out the rest of the month. Cancel if you don't like it. I know you're going to love it. Hundreds of hours of bonus content just like this, but better. Plus Growcast TV, which is a live interactive video web show every single week. We've got the AMAs to make sure your garden problems are solved. And I'm in the Discord every single day, hanging out with the Gromies, chatting, helping people out, swapping seeds, whatever. It's all taking place in the order of cultivation. Growcastpodcast.com slash membership is where you can find it, folks. Go and get it. The order of cultivation. You won't regret it. And again, join today. I'll refund your entry fees. See if you like it. I know you're going to love it. That's all, everybody. Like I said, just a few short days. SoCal, Friday the 18th. Cultivator's Cup on 423. Hope you're growing something fire to submit to that. And uh, that's down in Southern Illinois. And uh, that's all, folks. Like I said, get in the order. Join the order. I'd love to see you there. Mm, This is Jordan River. I'll see you next time. We got some uh, Hawaiian breeders coming up talking about the legendary Molokai Frost. We got more on the horizon, some microbe control talk. Don't miss out, everybody. Stay tuned. All right, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye, everyone.